Okay, I think I'm live now, friends. Anybody, uh, can you see me over there? <laughs> oh, Stephen says I'm on. Oh, goodness. Thank you. Sorry, we had trouble with that. Uh, we're not sure exactly what happened, but uh, we just got the spinning wheel of death uh, from Facebook. But it's all, I think, um, settled now. So let's, let's continue to worship together, friends. Welcome, and thank you for being here with us in this way. You know, when I'm upset, I have never found it particularly helpful to have someone say to me, calm down. I'm also finding it somewhat less than comforting to hear people say during this national time of crisis and global pandemic, fear not. I know that God is all the time saying that to people in the Bible and it's the angel's favorite greeting, but if I'm being honest and <clears throat> if I'm setting aside my concern about what you think about my <laughs> limited faith, the phrase fear not is just, well, it's not doing it for me right now. I've been reading about fear this week and I came across some interesting experiments about fear and anxiety and stress and how those things muddle our decision-making processes and often lead us to make terrible decisions that we would otherwise not make. One that stuck with me was uh, done in the 70s with some seminary students. They were asked to teach a Bible study to children on the parable of the Good Samaritan. You know, the one where the guy gets beat up and left for dead on the road. Two well-respected people walk on the other side of him, uh, other side of the road from him and avoid him. But the Good Samaritan dresses his wounds, puts him on his animal and takes him to an inn and pays for his complete recovery. <clears throat> so the seminary students are asked to teach this parable to some children. And when they show up to their building, they're instructed that the children are across campus. Along the way, uh, intentionally in their way, there's an actor who's bracing himself in a doorway and pretending to be in respiratory distress. He's coughing and heaving, trying to catch his breath. He's clearly not doing well. Now, one would expect seminary students who have already been conditioned with the parable of the Good Samaritan to stop and render aid. And they did, except for a group of students who were put under stress. See, they told some of the students that there had been a mix-up with the time and they were already late and the children were all waiting on them and they needed to run across campus to get there as soon as possible. Now, I don't remember the exact numbers, but almost none of the students who were stressed stopped and helped the man along the way. In fact, the vast majority of them said once they got to the place where they thought the children would be that they never even saw a man in a doorway under distress. They were so focused on getting to those children, they didn't even notice somebody who couldn't breathe right in a doorway that they walked or ran past. Fear and stress cause us to miss things we would normally notice, and they can cause us to ignore people whom we might normally want to help. In our gospel reading this morning, we find the disciples are afraid. Jesus gets in a boat, they follow him. Many of them are fishermen, so boats are like their second home. And then a windstorm rises up, and it's a really bad one. Matthew's gospel says the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. He is Jesus. He was needed in this moment because things are not looking good. How bad does a storm have to be to make fishermen believe that they're going to die? Now, perhaps the fear started with the non-fishermen who were in the boat, right? The ones who had previously done other things in their lives before they became disciples. Maybe this was their first time in a boat and they were the first ones to start freaking out and asking questions. Maybe they couldn't swim. And so you expect that the fishermen who were in the boat at the time were able to calm them down at first. But at some point, fear takes over the entire crew. This is a bad storm but he was asleep. How could he sleep through a windstorm this bad? The boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. So they do what we all do in that circumstance. They wake him up and they yell at him, Lord, save us, we're perishing. 
When Mark's gospel tells this same story, the disciples include the phrase, don't you care? Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Lord, save us. We are perishing. I wonder what they thought Jesus was going to do about it. Maybe nothing, right? I mean, maybe <clears throat> they just wanted him to be in this moment with them. You know how it helps to have someone there with you when things are scary. Even if that person can't do a single thing to change the situation, it just helps to know you're not alone in the midst of the storm. I think that's what the disciples were thinking when they woke Jesus up and yelled at him. They just couldn't bear to not have him present with them in the midst of this really frightening storm. And we know that feeling, don't we? I have no idea what I expect Jesus to do right now in the midst of this global pandemic. But I definitely need to know that he's listening and not asleep. Lord, save us. We're perishing. That's a good prayer to pray right now. It's an honest prayer to express in the midst of our fear <clears throat> in this wild sea of unknown things. Jesus wakes up and asks a weird question. Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Uh, dude, we just told you we're afraid that we're about to die. This storm is swamping our boat and we cannot see the shore and we're not sure if we're ever going to see the shore. We're afraid because this is a big deal. This is our lives. These aren't metaphorical waves. These are the kind of waves that can knock you out of the boat and make you drown. These are the kind of waves that can fill up a boat with water and make it sink. These are the kinds of waves that can tear a boat apart. We're afraid that we're going to die. I really don't understand Jesus' question, nor do I claim to understand the direct relationship between fear and faith. I know lots of people who say that they do understand this connection and this question, that we're not supposed to be afraid right now. The phrase that I've been reading and hearing this week is that fear knocked on the door and faith answered and there was no one there. Now, Maybe it's me. Maybe I just don't have enough faith to overcome my fear at this point in my life. I mean, I would love to be there and to tell you that I'm there and to have you think all the great thoughts that you would then think about my faith, but I still experience fear. And until I get to the point where I don't, I'm going to keep doing what the disciples did in that storm. I'm going to cry out to God, Lord, save us. We're perishing. Because after Jesus asks his difficult, if not impossible, question, he gets up, he rebukes the wind and the seas, and there was a dead calm. That's power. The disciples weren't expecting that, clearly. They didn't wake Jesus up expecting him to calm the storm. If they'd had that expectation, then they wouldn't have been so shocked when it actually happened, right? They were amazed. And they asked themselves, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? We've heard his teaching. We've seen him heal the sick and cast out demons. We've been a part of him multiplying food and feeding thousands of people. But this, this is different. Maybe it was different because of the scale of it. Or maybe it was different because of the suddenness with which the wind and the waves bowed down to his command. I suspect it was different in part because this time it involved them directly, right? This time they had their own skin in the game <clears throat> and that changes things, doesn't it? Well, right after this, they encounter two demoniacs in the land of the Gadarenes. Now, we don't know specifically where that is. We just know that it's on the wrong side of the tracks, as we used to say, or it's on the wrong side of the sea, as Matthew's gospel says. So these two demon-possessed men come out of the tombs 
and they're unclean in every possible way. And they're so fierce and unpredictable, it's said that no one can even pass by that way for fear of them. And they shout at Jesus, and he casts the demons out of them, out of the men, and into a large herd of pigs who then stampede off of a cliff and die in the sea. The pig herders run back into town. They tell everyone what happened to the demoniacs. The gospel then says the whole town came out to meet Jesus. But when they saw him, they begged him to leave their neighborhood. I've been angry at these townspeople this week. I mean, the nerve of them to beg Jesus to leave after he had just healed their two worst people, the two guys who'd caused them the most trouble. And I've been mad at them because I think I know why they ask him to leave. I think they were more concerned with the large herd of pigs that died than they were with the two men who were just saved. Jesus just wrecked their economy to save the lives of these two men who were so ravaged by demons they were forced to live in the tombs. I think the people of this little town were saying the same thing that some of us have heard and perhaps thought this week. Are we going to ruin our economy to keep people from getting the flu? We don't know how many lives social distancing will save, but we're starting to be pretty sure that we can tell how many lives this is going to hurt financially. If the coronavirus hasn't hit someone you know, <clears throat> it can be difficult to see why we're all changing our lives so drastically and risking so much to fight this invisible foe. I suspect the townspeople had written off the demoniacs. Right? They finally ran them out of town, and as long as those two guys stayed in the tombs and everyone knew not to go near them, well, life went on. And I'm guessing this large herd of pigs was a large part of this town's accumulated wealth. That's a lot to sacrifice for these two men whom they'd already learned to live without. They forgot these two men were their brothers. I mean, if it's just two crazy guys, then no, we don't want to lose our livelihood for them. But what if it's your father? What if one of them was your son or your brother or your best friend? I've been mad at these townspeople this week because they seem so callous and conniving, willing to trade life for a certain amount of economic privilege. But then I realize they were afraid too. They were afraid about how they were going to survive this new economic loss. What would they do to support themselves and the ones they love? How would they live now that the entire herd is gone? What are they going to eat? Of course, they couldn't see the two demoniacs. They were too stressed with their own crisis to see anything else. And in the midst of their fear, they ask the wrong thing. Instead of begging Jesus to save them, they begged him to leave. I get it. We are afraid, and our fear can blind us to the suffering of others. It can make us do and say things that we normally wouldn't say or do, but we must not make the same mistake as these townspeople. We need to follow the example of the disciples and cry out to God, Lord, save us. We're perishing. And when we do that, when we turn to God in the midst of our fear, we remember that there are things that are far more important to us as God's children than the value of our portfolios or the current state of the S&P 500 or the Dow. Now, I'm not saying that the economic consequences aren't scary or real, or devastating, but we dare not beg God to leave our neighborhood and try then to rely on our own strength in the American way to get us through this crisis. I think if we care more about the well-being of our economy than we do about the well-being of our neighbors, we're doing just that. We're asking God and the way of Christ to leave our neighborhood. 
if we can instead turn to God in the midst of our legitimate fears about this disease and the economic price we are paying and that we will have to pay in the future, we will remember that God has fed us before by dropping food from the sky. God has cared for us long before we were the wealthiest nation in the world. Back when we were enslaved people, God was caring for us. When we were considered a cult in the first century, God was caring for us. When we were persecuted and murdered because of our faith, God was sustaining us as a people. Now, no one escaped suffering, but we did escape despair. God has given us hope that far transcends this world. Christians have historically shined during seasons of plague and global epidemics. We are known to have been the ones who cared for the sick ones at the cost of our own lives, not thinking that God will somehow magically protect us from the plague, but knowing that God has already saved us in eternity. And we can therefore show our radical love to our neighbors. Just because we are Christians doesn't mean we are immune to the storm or the effects of it in our lives. But because we are Christians, we should have a perspective on all of this that sets us apart. Our hope is not limited to a cure in this world or the value of our retirement account. Our hope is in Christ, whose faith has saved us and who calls us to love even in the midst of fear. He did, after all, teach us to consider the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, how they neither work nor toil, yet they are clothed and fed by God. This is not a season for triteness or easy answers. And frankly, I think you should run from anyone who's trying to sell you an easy answer. This is a season for us to be honest about how difficult it is for us to be people of faith, to do the hard things and to do them with love. This is a season for us to cry out to God and then to serve one another while we wait for the waves to die down or for the boat to sink, knowing that our lives are held in God's eternal hands. We cannot survive this life on our own. We need God, and we need one another. We need to love God and one another in the ways that we are created and called to do. And right now, that is sacrificially and honestly. I would never tell you to not fear. I don't find it helpful or comforting. But I do think we're supposed to take our fears to God and to huddle close together in the midst of these scary times. Metaphorically speaking, of course, because we have to maintain social distancing and all of that. But won't it be an amazing witness if years from now we are known for having <clears throat> given so much of what we thought was essential to our way of life in order to save and protect the most vulnerable among us. My sisters and brothers, this is our time to be faithful, even in our fear, and to be sacrificial in our love. May God help us as we walk through this season together. Amen. May Christ calm the storms within and give you peace. Even as the waves continue to slap against your face, may God grant you the gift of knowing the peace of Christ that surpasses all understanding. And may the Holy Spirit keep you in our fellowship until we meet again.